Merci beaucoup. Alors, je propose maintenant, il nous reste environ 11 minutes, et je propose d'élargir la discussion. And uh, we can speak English or French as you wish, perhaps even Arabic, but I am not sure of that. So, who would like to intervene? Uh, even though I don't see him, yes, I see Karl Kaiser. There's Karl. I was sure you would, be, you would be the first one. You recently, you recently pointed out that majority voting is one way for the European Union to act, to be able to act now. How do you get there? And how do you see it now? particularly after the events uh, of the recent uh, two months, which make the notion of European capacity to act much more urgent? Well, it would be much easier for me if the decision-making process would be based on a majority, qualified but majority. But to be realistic, I don't think that in the short term we are going to change the rule. Because to abandon unanimity, it requires unanimity. A and I don't see this unanimity coming, frankly speaking. Everybody will be attached to their veto right. So we have to build with the tools that we have. It's certainly a big disadvantage. This is my point of view. A point of view which is not shared by everybody. President Michel, for example, believes that unanimity is a good way of uh, deciding because it puts everybody together. Yes, certainly, it puts everybody together, but about what? Because we are together about nothing, or about very thing, very, fit, very little thing. But for me, it would be much better to have the capacity of deciding by qualified majority, because it would be a big incentive for people to engage in discussions. If you know that uh, without you, nobody can do anything, you stay in your corner. You don't need to participate in the debate. You block it. And this is not the way to face uh, the geopolitical problems of the world. For sure not. But I have to be realistic. I don't think we are going to change this rule. So we have to look for some ways of going behind it. And I think the treaty provides by some ways of acting according with unanimity but uh, with a little bit more of flexibility on the implementation of the decisions. But forget about having majority rules on the next month. Bogdan. Thank you. <clears throat> we have overcome, uh, fortunately, the longest crisis of CSDP uh, after 2008, uh, and such instruments that were expected and uh, designed in this treaty, like uh, PESCO, for example, and those that were created recently, I mean European Defense Fund, show our ability to overcome such crises. Uh, but now we are in a very difficult uh, financial situation I mean, uh, uh, with allocation of so many funds, you know, to the fight with coronavirus and uh, with the uh, recovery fund. What about CSDP in future? Because CSDP, in fact, is an expression of our strategic autonomy of Europe. What do you think about the future of CSDP? Uh, I'm strongly in favor of reinforcement of uh, that policy. Maybe for those who do not know the acronyms, uh, maybe it could explain what CSDP is. Well, it's a very, I suppose everybody knows, common security and defense policy. The will to build a common way of ensuring our security and providing defense capacities. Well, it's true that in the current financial perspective, member states, when they allocated resources, they were not privileging this policy because the pandemic was there and because the internal issues were much more important at that critical moment. So CSDP has not been very well treated on the allocation of resources for these years. Nevertheless, we have started with a defense fund to provide support to uh, industrial military capacity. 
we need to have an industrial military capacity. It's utopical to believe that you are a security provider actor if you don't have an industrial capacity on the field of defense. So this has to be done. We need to increase our capabilities, and this starts by industry. It's not sufficient, but it's absolutely necessary. So we have this fund. We have the peace facility, a new instrument that we allow us to provide uh, even lethal equipment to our partners. When we go to train our partners in the Sahel, for example, we train them, but we are unable to provide them with military warfare. And when we train the, the Malian soldiers in our training camp, they have to come with their ammunition because we don't even provide ammunition for the training. Well, this has to be overcome, and this peace facility will allow us to do that. Not the solution for everything, but a big step forward. PESCO is, is, it is still on the first years of its development. We cannot ask PESCO to deliver results because the, everything in the defense field takes quite a long time. It will provide better results, and we will try to orient the PESCO projects to a more f field orientation, to more implementation, less logistic, and more action, more capacity of deploying. But it takes time. It takes time. We cannot ask PESCO to change the defense landscape of the Europeans in four or five years. Missions, we have launched two new missions. So yes, little by little, we are advancing. But I think that we have to have a kind of breakthrough, a jump, something different, something more, a qualitative step. And that's what we are proposing on the strategic compass. We have the battle groups. We have never used them. We have never used them because it has never been the need to use them? No. We have never been used then because we don't have the will or maybe the instrument is not well designed. That's why we propose new instruments on the strategic compass to reinforce the CSDP. Because frankly speaking, I don't see how we can be a real security provider at the geopolitical level if we don't pull more our forces. Altogether, the member states spend in defense five times more than Russia. Five times more than Russia. Altogether, we have as many soldiers as the US. But evidently, we don't have the same strength. So the only solution for us if we want to exist in the world is to pull more our capacities. Not to abolish the national armies and build the European army. This is utopical but to complement our capacities, our individual capacities, with a collective one, which could become the European pillar on NATO, complementary to NATO, as President Biden Macron has said. If we are not able to advance on this field, our strategic shrinking will continue, and we cannot afford that. We should not afford that. Thank you very much. So the last, uh, well, I will take two questions and then I stop. The first row, uh, the first row to the Riyadh, that's Lebanon. Thank you, Thierry. Uh, Dania Khatib from Research Center for Cooperation and Peace Building in Lebanon. I want to ask you something. The gentleman had told you that uh, because there is unanimity, when in decision making, it's very difficult to make decision. But you know, Europe is surrounded by a very, uh, a very unstable neighborhood. Look in the North Africa, Lebanon, Syria. Do you think at some point in time, we will come where Europe has an overarching strategy to deal with its neighborhood? Thank you. Well, an overarching, <laughs> an overarching strategy for the whole Mediterranean neighborhood. It's a, uh, really something difficult to build, and maybe we don't need an overarching strategy. In Europe, we use and abuse of the word strategy. 
we have a strategy for everything. We are producing a strategy on a weekly basis. Well, that's good. We have to have an idea of how to act. But sometimes we call a strategy to think that they are not a strategies. And a strategy is, is something of linking means and purposes. The resources you have and the objective you want to get. This is a real strategy. Sometimes we call a strategy what is at the end an analysis. I don't think we need a whole strategy from Gibraltar to Syria, but we need to have a clear idea of how to deal with our neighbors. And I think we have. Another different thing is that in the case of Lebanon, all our requests for the Lebanese political class to take their responsibilities have failed. Since the explosion on the harbor in Lebanon, President Macron, myself, President Michel, we have been pushing to the Lebanese political class to act and to face the challenge of the country. And it has been a big collective failure of the Lebanese political class, in spite of our, our pressures. Now it seems things are moving, but this is not a matter of having a strategy. This is a matter of that uh, in some countries there is a, a complete failure of the political system. And Europeans cannot replace the political system of others. We can help, we can push, we can provide financial support, we can put political pressure, but we cannot substitute them. And in the case of Lebanon, for me, it's very clear that uh, if there is no inside the country itself, the political resources, you cannot Brussels to bring a solution. Today, if we have, for example, the case of Tunisia, where there is a political development, and we have to to place ourselves with respect to this political development. In general terms, our ambitions for the Mediterranean have not been fulfilled. In general terms, the Mediterranean is not improving from the economic point of view. The gap between the north and the south is increasing. Our trade relations are not improving. The integration of the Mediterranean states, North Africa states, I'm thinking of Morocco and Algeria, continues being very weak. But there are some things in which Europeans, believe me, it's, it's impossible that we could provide the solution. In some other cases, I think that we have been very active and our action has been providing good results. The last case, I can mention Libya, in which not only us, together with other actors, we have managed to stabilize the situation. But in the case of Lebanon, only the political class of Lebanon can bring a solution to the Lebanese problems. Thank you very much. Last questions, we are already, well, two Frenchmen. So let's put your two questions. Maybe Professor Seagal, because I, I have to make a choice. And uh, I, I, unfortunately, we will have to wind up. Merci, merci uh, Thierry. Um, un des problèmes de l'Europe, qui a souvent été décrit, c'est le manque de confiance du citoyen ordinaire dans les institutions européennes. Ma question, est-ce que vous ne pensez pas que pousser actuellement une politique de santé unifiée au niveau de l'Europe, qui n'existe pas, aurait un intérêt évident pour le citoyen, mais aurait un intérêt au-dessus de ça pour la constitution de l'Europe elle-même, pour défendre d'autres buts européens, et que ce serait quelque chose de très concret qui permettrait d'augmenter la confiance dans l'Europe. Une politique européenne de santé, de santé cohérente, comme, 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 une, comme une question... De... Une politique européenne de santé non, ré ré répétez-le. Allumez les micros parce que sinon. Une politique européenne de santé, c'est ça que vous dites. My question was, don't you think that a common European policy in the domain of healthcare would enhance the confidence of ordinary citizens in Europe, something which is really needed, as we know, because there has been a deficit over the last years. Now he got it. Way, in in, in Est-ce que c'est du domaine du haut représentant pour la politique étrangère des affaires de sécurité uh, 
Non, mais je n'ai pas d'inconvénient à, à dire que la pandémie a montré que des capacités de l'Union européenne en matière de santé étaient très, très faibles, pratiquement inexistantes. Le traité n'a pas prévu de donner aux institutions européennes des capacités d'agir dans le domaine de la santé. Mais parfois, on demande à l'Europe des choses que l'Europe ne peut pas faire parce que personne ne lui a demandé de les faire. Qu'est-ce qu'elle doit faire, l'Europe C'est ce que le traité dit qu'elle doit faire. Dans le domaine de la santé, le traité ne dit pratiquement rien. Donc, le, le, les compétences de la Commission, des institutions communautaires sont très faibles. On les a développées à marche forcée parce qu'il fallait bien qu'il fallait bien qu'il y ait une instance de coordination des politiques nationales. Alors peut-être que dans la, la réflexion sur le futur de l'Europe, il faudra ce sujet sur la table. Est-ce que dans le futur, il ne faut pas que l'Union ait des compétences communes pour faire face d'une façon plus coordonnée à une menace commune Oui, sans doute. La pandémie nous l'a appris. La pandémie nous a appris que la réponse a été parfois trop national et parfois il a montré que chaque, chacun pour soi. On a vu les images de, 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 au début de la pandémie qui, qui, qui ont donné de l'Europe une, une image pas trop positive. Et les gens se disaient mais qu'est-ce qu'il fait l'Europe ben, ben, L'Europe ne fait pas grand chose parce que l'Europe n'a pas les compétences pour le faire. Puis après, oui, oui, c'est au niveau européen qu'on a poussé le développement des vaccins. C'est au niveau européen qu'on a poussé un achat commun euh, qui a été aussi critiqué au début. Mais imaginez-vous si tous les pays européens étaient allés chacun pour soi au marché des vaccins à essayer d'acheter de, des vaccins en faisant la compétence les uns contre les autres, une sorte d'enchère. Ça aurait été catastrophique. Donc ça, au moins, on l'a évité. On l'a évité parce que les États membres ont dit à la Commission, allez-y, au nom de nous tous, pour chercher ce, ce bien collectif, après on va le partager. On pourrait penser que maintenant, avec la montée du prix des gaz, ça serait une sage idée de faire une sorte d'achat, central d'achat du gaz. Ça serait sans doute dans l'intérêt de tous. Donc, donc oui, il faut avoir plus de compétences. Et permettez-moi que je réponde à votre question d'un point de vue géopolitique. Il faut accélérer les dons des vaccins de la part des États membres aux pays en développement. Il faut absolument accélérer ça. Parce qu'on a promis, on est déjà à quelques 300 millions de doses de promesses, mais jusqu'à maintenant, les dons réels, effectifs, sont vraiment, ne suivent pas le rythme de nos promesses. Et on fait face à une situation mondiale, le secrétaire général de l'ONU l'a dit à New York le jour, qui n'est pas, pas très acceptable. 3% de la population vaccinée dans les pays en développement, 3% en Afrique, 70% en Europe. Le déséquilibre vaccinal est énorme. L'Europe a exporté 700 millions de doses, mais une chose est exporter, une autre chose est donner. Les donations, il faut les accélérer. On est encore loin de nos engagements. Merci infiniment. Je crois que nous sommes obligés de nous arrêter là. Mais à propos de la dernière question, il faut toujours rappeler que, comme dans les armées, on ne peut bien faire que ce qui a été très préparé à l'avance. Et que dans des opérations aussi complexes que la crise sanitaire, euh, on peut dire que finalement, compte tenu du fait que, comme vous le rappeliez, ça ne fait la santé n'est pas une vraie compétence de l'Union de de européenne. On ne s'est quand même pas si mal débrouillé que cela. Euh, ça aurait pu être bien pire. Mais effectivement, euh, tout le monde reconnaît que ça doit être un sujet majeur pour l'avenir. Maintenant, nous allons nous arrêter là. Je vous remercie infiniment euh, de, de votre présence et de cette conversation. Je dois rappeler que nous avons pris du retard. Euh, à cinq heures précises, il y a le, la, 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 la session d'ouverture officielle et nous ne pouvons pas être en retard pour la session d'ouverture officielle. Ce qui veut dire que la euh, session suivante doit être un petit peu raccourcie et je vous demande de ne pas quitter vos sièges. Merci, cher Joseph Morel, de tout cœur. Merci, merci, merci professeur.